right, everyone. Thank you for joining us for tonight's webinar of Child Kind, the importance of seeking empathetic care for your child. We are thrilled to be joined by Dr. Schechter and uh, Meredith Trant. So if I said those wrong, I apologize now. Um, so this is kind of the agenda of the night. So we're going to go over a little housekeeping stuff, do some introductions about our presenters. They will present and then we'll take Q&A at the end. Tonight's initiative is a collaboration effort from myself at the Pediatric Pain Warrior Program. So my name is Casey Cashman and I am the director of the Pediatric Pain Warrior Program through the U.S. Pain Foundation. Um, and then Amy Graham, who was not able to join us, but with migraine at school. So a few housekeeping um, topics. This webinar is educational only. U.S. Pain Foundation and Migraine at School do not recommend or induce uh, endorse one treatment, therapy, or product. Questions will be taken at the end. To ask a question uh, on the Zoom, you can just type right into the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen, and we will get to your questions when that comes up. Please just make sure to try and keep your questions on topic. Um, understand that both Dr. Schechter and Meredith are not treating your child. Um, and so if we can just keep the questions uh, to the general nature, that would be great. Uh, and this webinar is being recorded and will be posted at a later date. Um, so now to meet our presenters. So Dr. Neil Schechter is a senior associate in pain medicine um, emeritus at Boston Children's Hospital, directed, directed the chronic pain program there and is on the faculty at the Harvard Medical School. He is the president of Child Kind, a global initiative to reduce pain in the ch children's healthcare institutions. Dr. Schechter received his medical degree from the University of Connecticut. He completed pediatric training at the University of Connecticut and fellowship trainings in development, developmental pediatrics at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard University in Boston. He has authored over 130 articles and is the senior editor of Pain in Infants, Children, and Adolescents, the major multidisciplinary textbook in the area of pediatric pain. He has served on numerous editorial boards and expert committees in the area of pediatric pain, including the World Health Organization uh, Expert Committee on Pediatric Pain and Palliative Care, the Task Force on Chronic Pain in Children of the, Amer in, of the American Pain Society, and um, the Lancet Commission on Pediatric Pain. He has given numerous named lectures around the world and received the Jeffrey Lawson Award for Advocacy in Children's Pain Relief from the American Pain Society. Dr. Schechter's initial research has focused on pain associated with cancer and sickle cell disease and the pain procedures associated with those conditions. Most recently, he has become interested in more common pediatric pains such as injection pain and functional pain syndromes, as well as developing strategies to alter pain-related practice patterns in healthcare providers and institutions. And then we have Meredith Trant, MSW. Meredith holds a master's degree in social work from Boston College. She has over 15 years of experience as a project manager, specifically with grant-funded projects. Prior to joining Childkind in 2019, her work as a project manager, manager gave her experience working within multidisciplinary teams, extensive knowledge of the data collection process, and years of content development experience. Specifically, she was the senior project manager for the grants division at Inflexion Inc., where she managed teams covering over 10 separate phase one and phase two grants. Several of her past projects focused on the field of pain management, including the development of a pain management education website. Most recently, she worked on a grant entitled Mobile Coach for Parents of Children and Adolescents with Chronic Pain, in which the team developed and pilot tested a mobile application providing psychosocial support for parents of children and adolescents with chronic pain. 
She has co-authored numerous journal articles and participated in several poster presentations. Together, these projects grew her interest in the mission of advocating for the appropriate prevention and treatment of pediatric pain. Well, that's a lot of stuff that you guys have done. So we appreciate you guys being here with us um, tonight. And Meredith, I just stopped sharing. So I'm going to now turn it over to both of you. <laughs> I'm not sure who's starting. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Casey. I will be handing it over to Dr. Schechter. I will get the presentation going here and hopefully everyone can see that clearly. Right. Yes. <clears throat> well, thanks, Casey, very much. Uh, I think our time is up uh, now after the introduction. So uh, have a nice evening, everybody. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, <clears throat> uh, as Casey mentioned, uh, uh, I've been working in the area of pediatric pain for many, many years, and uh, um, and child kind is a, a more recent um, uh, avocation for me. It's a nonprofit that everyone is volunteers at, but we'll talk about that later. But I thought the the purpose of our talk today would be it, it, there's so, so few of us here, and um, there's more on the panel actually. So so I think. Uh, that it, it'll be great just to have an informal discuss, a discussion about pediatric pain in general. And so uh, with it, towards the end, we'll talk a little bit about child kind and, and what it is, but I thought it would be helpful to have that discussion and address questions that you might have uh, as well. So I have the first slide, Meredith. So obviously uh, pain in kids involves more than kids and often pain involves uh, the parents experience the pain uh, equally, in fact, even more so, uh, as, for example, as evidence of this painting called The Sick Child by Mook. Next slide. Uh, and as you can see from this picture, uh, they actually experience it sometimes even more than the child. This is a little baby getting an injection, and you see the father's face about their experience. And in fact, there's actually been research that has um, demonstrated, looked at brain based studies that have looked at parts of the brain that are involved in the pain experience. And people looking at loved ones experiencing discomfort experience uh, stimulation in that exact part of the brain, not necessarily the physical part of the brain, but the emotional aspect of pain, which is such a critical part of it. So, so obviously we have to address uh, when we're dealing with pediatric pain, the pain in the whole family. Next slide, please. So this is a picture here of a, a very, empathic and thoughtful physician. This is uh, called the doctor, a uh, famous painting. And this guy's looking at uh, this little sick child lying there um, and um, expressing his concern and obviously his consternation about what's going on. But what you can't see in this picture and what's a critical thing is in the background. Meredith, could you highlight that with your cursor? That's the dad. And uh, he's sort of lurking in the background anxiously, not really involved in all of this standing in the background. And that's one of the problems, of course, with all of this is that we need parents to be actively involved in the diagnostic and treatment process. And, and we'll talk all about that as we go forward. Next slide. So what I wanna talk about a little bit today, and again, our time is quite short to give a course in pain man management. And of course, most of you know a lot of this anyway, but, um, but we're gonna start by talking a little bit about acute versus chronic pain and those distinctions, and that's very important. The actual incidence of pain in childhood and, and what the consequences are if it's untreated. Then a little bit, just a little bit about how we assess pain and treat pain. Uh, a very little bit about that. That's not the focus of this discussion, but I'm happy to discuss that with you uh, in the question and answer period. And for that, we're gonna get at a, a variety of other factors. In particular, factors that complicate our pain care, why it's less than ideal. And then again, a little bit again about how to advocate for your child and some of the barriers that you'll find, that we all find about adequate, that prevent adequate adequacy. And, and finally, a little bit about Child Kind International, which is the organization that um, we, Meredith and I, are, are part of. Um, and we'll talk about that in, in some detail. But basically, it involves uh, pain experts from really across the United States um, attempting to do help institutions do a better job with pain management at the institutional level, not at the level of the clinician, but at the institutional level, to make a co commitment to, to pain management so that every child who enters the door of any of those institutions can be 
the family can be somewhat reassured that this institution is committed, at least to some extent, to that. Okay, next slide. So acute pain is the pain that most of you are familiar with. It's the pain that we uh, experience when we have any sort of injury. Uh, typically, it um, arises from tissue injury and or trauma of one sort or another. Acute pain is defined as lasting less than 12 weeks. Even if there was trauma, for the most part, pain doesn't persist beyond 12 weeks. Um, it classically has a warning function, and that is there's something going on here. The body is being alerted to that fact. It signals that there's some nociceptive or pain event, some tissue uh, uh, issue in the tissues. Uh, it's typically self-limited over time and is accompanied by signs of sympathetic nervous system arousal. That's the nervous system, the fight or flight nervous system. So with acute pain, there's perspiration, there's, um, there's heart rate increases, there's blood pressure increases, there are a variety of changes that we typically see. And it's typically assumed that how much pain you have reflects the level of tissue damage that you're experiencing. Next slide, please. So if you have a musculoskeletal problem, one of the things we might look at is this, and this is obviously a, a cause of acute pain in this individual with uh, musculoskeletal problems, and that alert doctor is, uh, is identifying that. Next. And if you have a, a, a abdominal pain, here's another unusual explanation for abdominal acute pain, but here's the, the porcupine that he finds in the abdomen. So that's acute pain, and it's pretty straightforward for the most part. Addressing it is not as straightforward, but identifying it is typically pretty straightforward. Next slide. Chronic pain is, is different, however. It's quite multifactorial often. It often does not have a clear etiology. There's not a shark or a porcupine that we find. Uh, sometimes we do, but very often we don't. Um, if there is an inciting stimulus, for example, um, the pain lasts beyond the expected healing time for that inciting stimulus. And likewise, the pain does not reflect, if it's stemming from some sort of uh, initial tissue damage uh, and then persists, or even if there's no tissue damage, the pain doesn't reflect the state of the tissue. So there seems to be more pain than one might expect from the damage that seems to be present. Um, and it's not reflected in nervous system arousal. So you often with acute pain, with chronic pain, don't see increases in blood pressure, increases in heart rate, galvanic skin responses, those kinds of things. So that's what's deceiving. And people will say, well, you can't really be having a 10 out of 10 pain because there's no evidence of that uh, on, on the measures that we're looking at. And of course, that's fallacious, um, but that's one of the problems in addressing chronic pain. And typically it results from a sensitized nervous system. And we're gonna talk a little bit about this and I'm gonna get into the weeds a little bit with you. Some of you may be familiar with all of this, but I wanna just run through this. And this will be the most detailed thing we're gonna talk about. So uh, get ready. Uh, next slide. Oh, it's not that. Sorry, I have another slide coming up. Uh, this is the, a little bit of the incidence of acute pain. And, uh, and obviously it's pretty common. Uh, there are lots of studies of kids in hospitals and 25 to 50% of kids experience moderate to severe pain while in the hospital. Um, uh, often, it is needless pain, if you will. It is often situations where we could do something about that, but sometimes we don't. Um, and there's not, not for malicious reasons, but for a whole host of reasons that we'll talk about. Chronic pain is a different story, very common. 30% um, of outpatient visits are for symptoms that can't be explained by classically organic disease. And the chronic pain is um, typically about 25% of kids experience some sort of chronic pain over, at some time. Girls much more frequently than boys. Um, peaking in the pediatric world between 12 and 15, when we start to see a lot of the incidents of this sort of post-pubertal, although sometimes a little before. Girls, again, as I mentioned, two to one, three to one, four to one with most of these conditions. And importantly, and something I'm particularly interested in, most people who have a specific chronic pain have multiple sites of chronic pain. So that's what's called um, overlapping pain conditions. So 25 to 50% of the time, if you have abdominal pain, you might have musculoskeletal pain. And that's because you have a heightened nervous system. Information is passing through your nervous system at a more rapid rate uh, at a lower threshold than one would expect. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Next slide. So here's sort of a very, um, a kind of a, 
a cartoon basically of kind of nociceptive pain, which is the classically acute pain, and then what's called neuropathic pain or the pain of nerve damage, if you will, and then what's called centralized pain that I'll talk about later. And those are some of the conditions associated with it. And the next slide, please. And again, pain occurs in different phases of, of development. Um, acute pain can happen at any time, obviously. It can be needle pokes early on. This is not totally accurate. We took this from the Lancet. Uh, commission, which I was a part of, but I, there's some issues I would have with the, the timing of all of this. But anyway, uh, lots of procedural pain occurs throughout uh, the lifespan, certainly in children. Um, there's other kinds of pain. Chronic pain tends to be, I would suggest functional abdominal pain and those kinds of pains that tend to occur a little bit later than toddlerhood, for example. I, I work in a chronic and abdominal pain clinic and that would be very rare in young kids. Again, most of these things tend to come up just pre-puberty or post-puberty for the most part. Uh, and then obviously lots of surgeries occur. So throughout the pediatric lifespan, if you will, there are different times when there are a variety of chronic and, and acute pains taking predominance. Next slide. And this is the one that I mentioned to you before. So let's run through this together if we could. Uh, and this is what I would suggest to you as current thinking about, uh, about the chronic pain in adults as well as children. And it's a multifactorial complex phenomenon. So there's a biological predisposition that many people have. And for those of you who have a child with pain at this moment or are familiar with it, often there's a genetic predisposition. There's a family history in someone who might have a similar condition. There's micro trauma. That's what we talk about with Ehlers Danlos syndrome, where constantly the joints are doing things they're not exactly supposed to do. There's early life events of one sort or another. There's temperamental differences that might predispose. We did some research on kids with one type of temperament versus another, who and their reaction to needle pain, for example, and other sorts of stressors that occur. So that's a biological predisposition. And then there's psychological factors that may or may not play a role uh, in creating this vulnerability. Um, and then those create, in particular, this what we call pain vulnerability, what's known now as central sensitization. And for those of you who are, you know, have read up on this, that's the key element of all of this, that your nervous system is conditioned to react to stimuli at a much lower level. Your pain thresholds, and we have study after study after study that looks at how you know from pressure, temperature, a whole host of things, even to different medications, a different response pattern in people who have multiple chronic pain problems. Anyway, you have that vulnerability, and then there's some type of trigger. And that trigger can be uh, an infection. It can be a GI infection. It can be a strep throat. It can be a low-grade inflammation. It can be some environmental stressor of one sort or another. It can be a psychological stressor. It can be trauma like concussion. It can be vaccinations. It can be any number of things that often, often provoke in a pain vulnerable individual what we now call primary pain disorders, which are used to be called functional pain disorders. And in, in belly, if they're belly, in the belly, they're called G, DGBI, di, diseases of gut-brain interaction is the new terminology for uh, those types of conditions. Headache of one sort or another. In particular, we're talking about tension headache. Um, but uh, they, obviously migraine might as well, but it's a slightly different phenomena. Um, widespread musculoskeletal pain, or what's traditionally called fibromyalgia. And again, psychological factors can play a role uh, in this, and but also can certainly impact your psyche. I mean, it's very, one would expect anxiety, depression, and whatever to result from the persistence of, of chronic pain that pulls you away from normal socialization, interferes with your sleep and other aspects of your life. So that is a sort of a key little cornerstone, a little uh, cartoon basically that describes what we now, how we now think about this. Next slide, please. So when we treat these, because it's multifactorial, we think about a multidisciplinary approach as much as possible. That is a luxury that some of us have uh, to work in multidisciplinary teams. It's not always a luxury and not always available to in many sorts of settings. There are 20 to 50, I think 25 uh, chronic pain programs around the country, maybe a little bit more than that. They're all listed uh, in the uh, by IASP, the International Association for the 
uh, study of pain has has a listing of chronic pain programs around the country. And um, but uh, anyway, they are all multidisciplinary. They have uh, some type of pain doctor that could be a neurologist or a developmental pediatrician or an anesthesiologist or um, someone else, as another field rheumatologist. And then they'll have a psychologist always to address the, uh, some, some of the oversensitivity of the nervous system that they might be able to quell. And they often have a physical therapist. They might have other members of the team as well. And then there's a diagnostic process. And again, I won't go through all of this because it's, it's um, not really the thrust of our discussion today. But then at the end, there's some sort of formulation where you come up with the, after a, a thoughtful analysis, what's going on here. And then the treatment involves, and number one, I would suggest the feedback that occurs from the team. And that's something I've been very interested in. We have a, a, a couple of papers that we've written about feedback and we'll talk about that. But it's very important to let families know that we understand these problems, that they're not a mystery to us and that we know how to address them. And then the, the standard modalities that many of you are familiar with. There's pharmacological modalities. And again, we can talk about that later, but that's not the thrust of this talk. Physical, getting people moving again, who've been uh, sedentary for a period of time and have muscle loss and have pain when they move. And obviously psychological interventions to address an oversensitized hyped up nervous system um, that can help somewhat. And then also very importantly, addressing non-pain concerns. Chronic pain brings with it a lot of fellow travelers, uh, for example, um, sleep disturbances, uh, social engagement issues, um, problems with um, uh, fatigue, a whole host of things, sometimes autonomic nervous system dysfunction, for example, postural and kinds of things in, in which other things are going on that not are specifically pain related, but often, take a huge to toll on the quality of life that the individual is experiencing. Um, so anyway, that's in a nutshell how we think about this. Next slide. Um, here's something about multidisciplinary teams, just suggesting that there's a lot of value in that. Again, I'm saying this, but very often these are not available and that is not the case of death if they're not available. But we do know that when one treats pain problems in a multi-dimensional way, as opposed to a multimodal way, as opposed to a unidimensional way, just drugs or just psychological support or just a procedure that people do much, don't do as well as if they have a, a multidisciplinary approach. And then we see in in studies, uh, meta-analyses of multiple studies, reduction in medication use and less healthcare utilization, generally improved function, reduced hospitalization, subsequently and better adherence to recommendations if we're dealing with a whole team. Next slide. So uh, one of the cornerstones of, of dealing with pain, and again, this may be familiar to many of you, and I, I apologize if it's all uh, re repetition, and we've heard multiple talks about this, but I feel somewhat obligated to discuss some of these sorts of issues with you, given my limited time uh, and access to you to, to sort of uh, uh, let you know some of how we think about these things. So when we we can't treat pain unless we know it's there. And, um, and we need to know it's there in a way that uh, is valuable to uh, allow us some sort of thoughtful intervention. And in fact, when I first started in the world of pediatric pain, we couldn't assess pain adequately. And we tended to dismiss pain in children because they were just crying or whatever. We really didn't know how to assess the pain of a newborn or a, a child with a developmental problem or a three-year-old or even a five-year-old for the most part. Uh, and there was a tendency, as I mentioned, to be dismissive. And we published a number of papers on, on that unfortunate state. Um, over the age of eight, we know that kids for the most part have the psychological capabilities to, to take an abstract thing like a number and link it to a sensation. And uh, some kids can do that when they're younger, uh, some kids can't. But usually over the age of eight, we typically use numerical rating scales, um, like a visual analog scale. Um, that's typically what we use uh, for older kids. Sometimes we use the faces scale and other kinds of scales for those kids as well. But more uh, typically, in, certainly in research purposes, we use a, a, num a numerical scale from one to 10, or zero to 10. Um, between three and eight is sort of the, sort of the um, borderline area. And their kids sometimes can't use 
uh, can't take an abstract construct like a number and link it. So we use modified self-reports and that's what we use cartoon faces as you all are familiar with. We use color scales. There's a whole host of things that have been developed, something called the Oucher, which looks at pediatric faces. I mean, there's kids' faces and you, which is the face like your face. So there are many, many attempts to uh, to get in that in that particular age group um, to understand the amount of discomfort they're experiencing so that we can treat it appropriately. For children under three, they mostly require composite measures. And those involve a variety of things. And again, here, for the most part, we're not talking about chronic pain, we're talking about acute pain. And, um, and then we use something called the FLAC, which face, legs, arms, cry, something else. Uh, anyway, but a bunch of other measures. And those scales take physiologic things like uh, heart rate and position, of the child cry, comfort a bill, how much they how much we can comfort them, and a variety of other things, and, and put them in, into a numerical, numerical scale for us. So we can assess in a pretty sophisticated way the amount of pain a child is experiencing. There are also much more uh, granular scales than the FLAC for younger kids. There's a, a, a scale for preterm babies, there's a scale for newborns in general. There's this, another scale that for uh, individuals who are non-communicative, uh, who have developmental problems. But for the most part, um, and we sometimes use other scales for them, but for the most part in younger kids in most institutions, you'll see the FLAC being used. You'll see the FACES scales in slightly older kids and the numerical scales in older kids than that. None of these are particularly helpful with chronic pain, however. Uh, and that's problematic, right? Because uh, very often you just be experiencing the same level of discomfort and it's hard to know what to do and it's hard to know if there's any progress that we've made. So for the most part, in most chronic pain programs, we tend to emphasize functional scales. In other words, to, to monitor improvement. Are you getting to school now? Are you less fatigued? Can you move around a little bit more? Are you socially engaged a little bit more? Are you eating okay? Those kinds of measures, and the one we use is the FDI, but there's lots of them out there. And every time somebody comes into our clinic, we, we look at that particular scale. We ask them about their pain somewhat, but we know the pain is gonna be there for the most part. So what we're looking for is, um, is uh, improvement in function because we know that function precedes pain reduction. And that's something that's a very, very important uh, principle that we work with in the world of chronic pain. Next slide. So um, that now we've assessed it, what the hell are we doing this for? What's the purpose of any of this? Why even think about pain? It's, well, obviously, unnecessary suffering is it's a moral imperative. It's a human right. If we can avoid suffering, why not do that? But there are also consequences that we know of persistent pain. Um, some of the early work looked at immune suppression. Uh, which impacted healing and recovery. A lot of that was in newborns, but we know that, as a matter of fact, that, that there can be immune suppression associated with persistent pain. There's a longer stay, decreased participation in health recommendations. We know if pain is untreated. Um, there's increased health care utilization. So there's more tests and more medications and more visits um, that occur, uh, more frustration for the families as a result. Um, inadequate treatment of acute pain can lead to chronic pain, as Casey had suggested in our little discussion previously. And, and there's a lot of work. I've been on a couple of task force that have looked at the acute to chronic pain transition. And that's a complex area looking at mechanisms. There's a loss of income for families. And in some families, some of the research suggests almost a loss of income of $25,000 a year, non-working loss of, the, of ability to work, expenditures for a variety of kinds of tests. Um, going from place to place, doctor to doctor. So it's, these are very uh, uh, untreated pain yields, these kinds of things. And the fear of future medical care. And uh, Next slide, please. And I want to talk here about a study that we did a long, long time ago, but uh, I think it, it bears discussion. Um, so many, many, many years ago, uh, in the 90s uh, or so, when we were just starting to learn about pediatric pain. It seems amazing. It's going to be, this is going to be amazing what I'm going to tell you now. But for the most part, when we were treating pain, like with for lumbar punctures for kids with cancer, we did not sedate them because we, we didn't know how. 
um, we didn't want to kill them, but we didn't know how to sedate them. So we give them some sort of medication. Sometimes we'd certainly use local anesthetic, but for the most part, uh, we used we didn't know what to do. So a group of us developed a, a kind of oral lollipop that um, we could use to sedate children, and um, that didn't require a needle, and uh, was uh, uh, and the kids would fall asleep, uh, and then we could do the the lumbar puncture without any pain in the child for the most part. And so the first where it's a study in this chart over here uh, is the kids who took the our lollipop and and they had less pain than the kids who who didn't take our lollipop. So the placebo group, which is the yellow group, had more pain, if you will. However, all of these kids had cancer and all of them needed subsequent lumbar punctures. So for all of the subsequent lumbar punctures, we gave the kids active drug, no placebo anymore. The study was over. We wanted to help them along and uh, obviously didn't want, now that we knew this worked, we didn't want to uh, subject them to unnecessary discomfort. However, as you can see from this chart, the kids who had the initially negative experience reported more pain out to four procedures than the kids who had the initially positive experience. In other words, that initial negative experience was imprinted in the child and they experienced more discomfort. And even the drug that we were giving them, which is a very potent medication, um, could not eliminate, reduce the pain and get it back to sort of a normal level. And thus told me right from the start how important it is to be aggressive about procedure pain right from the beginning for kids undergoing, who are undergoing significant treatments in the future. Next slide. All right, so there's a lot of factors that make pain care. One would say, well, we know a little, now we know how to assess it, and we figured out a lot of the drugs for how to deal with it, um, and we know it's pretty common. What's stopping us from doing an adequate job? Um, and there are a number of things that get in the way and make this complicated. Number one, there's a lot of a lack of physician education about pain. Uh, the US Pain Foundation is going around helping educate folks, and we have. Gone, I've done, I can't even tell you how many lectures to different physician groups around the country and around the world, actually, and to help uh, uh, give them more knowledge about the importance of treating pain. And in fact, even JACO now has uh, the Joint Commission that improves hospitals, if you will, has a couple of pain criteria in their um, accreditation of hospitals. Very minimal. Not what we like to see, uh, but but something. They're starting to recognize its importance. And many states have, on licensing exams, pain questions as well. So we're certainly moving in the right direction. But there's still, a, I'd say, a paucity of information. Another thing, especially in the chronic pain world, is the nagging doubts about the diagnosis. And uh, uh, do we need more tests? Did we miss something? Did we do enough? And that leads to an investigative carousel, if you will, of more and more and more and more testing. And sometimes you find something wrong that probably is completely a coincidence, but yet then we pursue those kinds of things and leads to more doctors and more investigation. And um, so um, there's ways to deal with this, if you will, uh, and so that we can continue to investigate if we feel the need to, but we can also address chronic pain while we're dealing with it. Um, so that one doesn't exclude the other. But that often has been an issue about, well, before we do anything, let's just do more and more and more and more invasive tests. Families who come to us typically have seen many doctors um, when we're dealing with chronic pain and sometimes receive very confusing or even contradictory information. Um, one person says it's this, another person says it's that. There are a lot of hot diagnoses that uh, people tend to come up with at different times that they feel explain all of the problems that their child might be having. Those tend to sometimes be accurate, but more often these are much more complex problems than that. And so, um, so uh, they have, um, it's very important to uh, address families as we'll talk about and, and let them recognize that they've been through a treadmill of seeing many, many people and sometimes getting increasingly frustrated. And let me just tell you as well that physicians get very frustrated by this uh, also. Not infrequently, very often, as a matter of fact, we'll hear some families feel that they were blamed for their child's pain, that they, they felt or heard that someone said, this is all in your head. 
and you're making this up. I don't see anything wrong with you. My pain assessment measures, your blood pressure is pretty normal. Everything looks good. And this is a psychological problem and shunt them off after a ton of investigation without an organic explanation to a psychologist. Uh, that does not help and that's inaccurate and uh, number one and, uh, and certainly not helpful and frustrating. And because many, as I mentioned to you, this ongoing, um, uh, ongoing um, uh, or overlapping pain conditions, many people have seen physicians in different arenas They've seen a rheumatologist and they've seen a gastroenterologist and they've seen uh, an ENT doctor if they have dizziness and they've seen a, a GI doctor if they have nausea. And, and sometimes people don't communicate that well with each other. Um, they reinvent the wheel very often. Um, they have a slightly different explanation for the problem, which is sometimes confusing for families. And it's very hard for people to, especially when a chart is... Uh, 10 pounds, uh, at least historically, now it's all pixels. But uh, when it's a large chart, it's hard for people to review all that information. And sometimes they don't know exactly all the experience that the child has had. Next slide. Uh, in addition, uh, in an outpatient way, these problems take a long time to address. Um, you can't do it in five minutes or 10 minutes. The average office visit is seven or eight minutes. Um, you just can't do it. Um, there's so much here, there's so much depth. Um, that needs to be explored that um, that a busy office just not, does not lend itself to it. Uh, again, there's a, typically a lack of a quick fix. Certain, you know, and as physicians, we're taught to fix these kinds of problems. Uh, and you can't fix some of these things. You can work with them. You can tweak them. You can get some people better, but some people we're going to be, it's going to be a tweaking process that you're going to do. And the most important thing is the relationship that we establish. Uh, and that relationship is absolutely essential. If it's a trusting relationship, that goes a very long way. And there's data, for example, in choosing physician, that people um, rate, if you will, the relationship with the physician as more important than if they have eliminated or reduced the pain significantly. So, um, and there are studies that address that. And again, the fact that pain causes other problems um, that are, are needed to that need to be addressed to have a really full recovery, it's hard for the typical subspecialist to know about who's in one area, to know about how to help it sleep or how to get a kid back to school who's been out of school and doesn't want to tell people why and doesn't, know, doesn't have a script about what to say or how to get people socially engaged again. Uh, uh, anyway, so these are a lot of factors that make this complicated. Next slide. So, um, uh, again, this is addressed to folks here uh, a little bit about how to advocate. And again, this is both for chronic and acute, but but most of this is for chronic pain, what I'm talking about. And you want to be prepared to give a good history of what's going on. Where's the pain? Does it occur at any particular time of day? Do the locations vary? Is there a relationship to anything that you can identify? How long does it last? Uh, what makes it better? What makes it worse? Is there a family history of these things? Are there recent triggers that may have caused it? Uh, in the old days, we used to ask for diaries, and those are sometimes helpful. <clears throat> uh, in the beginning, as you're starting to sort this out and figure things out. But uh, I have had parents bring in the Encyclopedia Britannica of, of diaries. Uh, every, and at a certain level, that's no longer helpful. And at, at a certain level, it calls, calls attention to the discomfort when you're constantly asking about pain. So once you know we have some initial information, a month or so of the headache or two months of when the belly pain is occurring, is it related to this or that or the other thing? Um, once we have that information, a diary is not as helpful as we think it might be. Ne next slide. Uh, in the hospital, um, some of the things that we look for that are very critical and which are part of what we think about when we're talking about child kind certification of hospitals, and we'll get to that in, in, in a bit, is that the team knows your child somehow, and you're the only one who really knows your child. You know his or her temperament. You know how they've reacted to procedures in the past. You know how um, uh, they um, their mood at a particular time. You know what time, how to approach them, what comforts and what doesn't comfort them. And really, the team has to ask about you have to tell it. But if the team doesn't ask about it, 
you need to assert that this, you know, we've had that in the past and my child does better with this medication, with this type of sedation or whatever. They may not have that information. And so that implies the next thing is be involved in your child's pain care plan. Um, many, most pediatric facilities have child life professionals who can help with distraction and comfort, comforting the child. And for procedures in particular, they're life savers and they're wonderful to have around and we should take full advantage of them. Um, uh, one of the problems that we have with pain is sometimes nobody knows who's responsible for treating it. So you have a surgical procedure and, uh, and then the surgeon says, well, look, the wound looks pretty good, but uh, you're still suffering. Well, throw some more oxycodone. Nobody call this person, call that person. Um, so there isn't a, a kind of clear accountability for the pain, a clear channel. And that really, we need to know who that person is. Again, before any skin breaking procedure, we want a topical anesthetic. And that is a very, very, very important. We can't, sometimes it doesn't occur in labs. It doesn't occur because of time constraints, but in hospital before an IV start for pediatrics, in a pediatric focused facility, there should be a local anesthetic. Um, and if you feel pain isn't adequately addressed, then many hospitals have a pain service and you should ask for involvement of the pain service just to be sure that everything is being offered to your child. That might be a benefit. Next. Okay, so as I implied to you, um, as you're selecting a physician or a pain program, a trusting relationship with a physician is essential. Um, when you're picking somebody, you wanna know that they have enough time. Um, again, these are ideal, this is an ideal world that I'm talking about, but you know, that we don't live in one, but, but if we did, these are the kind of things we'd wanna know. Is your physician comfortable with chronic pain issues? Um, and again, in some practices they'll, Acute, uh, you know, regular pediatric practices, they'll say, we have an afternoon for complex problems, complex pain problems or complex problems in general. And that we have, instead of a, uh, a 15 minute visit, an hour or a 45 minute visit associated, assigned to that. Something we're gonna talk about is optimism uh, a little bit. And there's a lot of literature on the value of optimism in both the family and in the physician. And if you're not very optimistic that you're going to make this child better or help this family, and if the family isn't very optimistic and say, well, I had my headache my whole life and my kid is going to have the same damn thing, that's not very good. And that predicts a much worse outcome. And obviously, we want to do a little bit, talk a little bit about empathy, um, which is, can the individual who's caring for you, whether it's a nurse practitioner or whatever, understand your experience, your concerns, your perspectives. Next slide. This is just a study that I just, it's fun uh, just to tell you about a little bit, but it, but it makes the point. So a guy named Ted Papchuk, who is uh, uh, at uh, Beth Israel um, Hospital in Boston, he did a study with a lot of adults with IBS, which is a very disabling problem for many people. And, um, and they were assigned after being evaluated to either a waiting list control, a waiting list, they were put on a waiting list, or to a placebo acupuncture, so not real acupuncture, going to a different location than one would expect it would help belly pain. But anyway, with in a limited capacity, that means the acupuncturist would come in there, do their work, and leave. Okay, and and that's called limited. And then or an augmented, which is the person would come in and talk to you, have a little bit of a relationship while they're doing that. It could be another two minutes. Um, or, you know, it wasn't a big thing, but there would be some empathy displayed, some caring about you as an individual, finding out where you go to school or um, uh, anything that was your favorite, anything that they wanted. Anyway, um, they found that the even though it was placebo acupuncture in both of them, for the limited and the augmented, that on the waiting list, people over time got a little bit better. People symptoms were allevi alleviated a little bit by the placebo acupuncture in the limited one, but they were much better by the augmented. In other words, the person with whom they had a relationship. And at the end of the day, CapChuck thinks that placebo and a lot of other things are all in the relationship and the value of the relationship with the clinician. And that's very, very important. Next slide. 
So a couple of final things that I just want to talk about before Meredith tells you about Chakai. Again, I think it's very important for families and the physician to have a very positive attitude about what's going on. We can help this kind of thing. Um, we want to adequately evaluate the problem to provide some reassurance that it's not an obvious uh, thing that we're missing, but not so much as to fuel the continued desire for further and further and further testing. And we know for a fact, as a matter of fact, that people who have a lot of health anxiety, for example, no amount of testing is going to make satisfy them. And people who don't, there was a, an interesting study on endoscopy, endoscopic, um, you know, putting a tube down into your belly and people both of whom had sort of worried about ulcers and people who had in advance high health anxiety, they were satisfied for about a week, but that test where it was negative was okay. And then they were worried about more tests. The people who had low health anxiety, they were okay with that test. They said, well, we address that kind of problem. We don't have to. So it's that's a really complicated issue. And not when I want to get too much, but that whole issue of how much is enough is a very complicated problem. At the feedback, which is the critical thing in the beginning, we want the team or the physician to discuss your expectation, expectations. We want to provide an explanation that's understandable and makes sense to you. And the diagnosis should be a positive one. You know, this fits a pattern that I'm very familiar with. Um, you don't want to say, well, we ruled everything else out, so it must be this, because there's always another this, that you can, or no, another thing that you can rule out. There's something somebody will find on the internet that somebody had and said, well, you know what, did you address this particular kind of problem? And you say, well, I didn't really, but that has occurred in one person in Malaysia, but that's okay. You know, so that's a very... And I don't mean to diminish this at all because it's obviously a very important thing for people, but the diagnosis should be positive. And that is it fits a pattern that makes sense um, for a primary pain disorder in particular. Um, next slide. Um, as I implied to you, be a part of your child's team. When we're doing tests, if, we, if the physician, this is a physician statement, if the physician feels it's gonna be negative, and we're doing it for that, you should tell the family, oh, we think this is gonna be negative. Um, because otherwise the family's anxiously waiting, maybe this is gonna be the answer. And so you wanna let people know, prepare people for negative results. But that's a positive thing, that that negative result is a positive thing. Something I don't have the time to talk about, but is a cornerstone, and we've written, I've written a number of articles about this, is the use of metaphors. And the one we typically use for chronic pain uh, is the metaphor of the computer and that uh, chronic pain is a software problem and not a hardware problem. And that's why all of the explanations that we've had looking at organic disease have not been fruitful, but because the fact is that the nerves are hypersensitive or over are sensitized, and that's what's going on with your child. And it's like a software problem. If there's a glitch in your computer's not working and you open up the motherboard, it looks normal yet the computer's still not working. And that's because there's a software problem. And that's the one we typically, we also use a false alarm. There's a bunch of metaphors that we use to help children understand that this is a real problem. It's not in your head. It's a software issue, if you will, and the way your nerves are, are handling information. And that's very important that we make that clear. Um, we want families to ask for written information uh, about what we're talking about. And again, we want to help them identify reliable sources of information. Next slide. So what I want to say to you uh, as my final kind of comments are that at the feedback section that you have, you want the following kind of information. You want to hear the following kind of information, that the clinician is familiar with this. I've seen this before. You're unique, but you are not a mystery to me. You're not a mystery to me. I've seen these kinds of problems. It fits a pattern that I'm familiar with. The clinician believes the child is experiencing pain. This is not in your head. I believe you. This is real pain. You're not making this up. You're not malingering. This is a legitimate problem that you're having, and we need to address it. And finally, that there's a sense of optimism. I've taken care of many children with this kind of problem. They do extremely well with these disorders, and they have, can have full, productive, and happy lives in the future. And it's very important to convey those kinds of things right at the outset. Next slide. So having said all of that about a chronic pain a, a little bit, um, I want to talk a little bit more about the acute pain situation. And again, acute pain uh, is common in the hospital, but 
acute pain often can lead to chronic pain, or you have a chronic pain problem and have acute episodes of what's called acute or chronic. And so not infrequently, these problems exist in a hospital setting. So why aren't we adequately dealing with this in the hospital? Well, there's typically a lack of culture in which pain management is a priority. What's a priority is healing your child, and that's very important, obviously. But equally, or just below that, there should be comfort as a high prior institutional commitment and priority, because if there isn't that, um, and, and again, there's this famous Dutch study where they looked at, asked parents what was important to them and how well the hospital did in regarding that. Curing the disease was of course the number one, but they were, they were pretty comfortable with how high the, uh, they rated the doctors in doing that. Keeping my child comfortable in the process was a second high priority, very low rate in terms of that as a, uh, as the clinicians addressing that. As I mentioned, limited uh, education, limited pain assessment or inadequate pain assessment, not developmentally appropriate pain assessment. And that leads to a lack of uniform approach throughout an institution. So we'll see very frequently, one uh, orthopedic surgeon will handle something in one way and another will handle an entirely different way. And obviously when we're independent practitioners, everybody's learned different kinds of things, people have experience, but it's very, distressing sometimes to see a child with a, a thoracotomy who one physician deals with in one way and another, the child obviously is having much more discomfort. And we know that there are ways to deal with that if the physician would just allow the pain service to handle it or at least uh, read up on what's currently how to address this. And as I mentioned before, a lack of clear accountability in the institution. So uh, the next slide. So, to address all of these, how am I doing for time, by the way? I don't have a watch in we're, we're running pretty close to out of time. So we got- Out of time? Yeah. Do we only have an hour? Okay. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, can we go a little bit longer or? Uh... Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Yes, I mean, as long as people, people can, if they have to go at eight o'clock, they still can and they'll still get the recording of this as well. Okay, great. So uh, to address all these kinds of, I'm sorry, I talked so long. Uh, so to address all these kinds of concerns, um, we recognize that to get this information that we now know to the bedside uh, was problematic and not happening. And there's been lots of studies of that. So we thought that what a number of us from multiple countries, but mostly from the US and Canada, got together who were involved in pain and felt that if we change the culture of institutions by encouraging institutional commitment to pain care that we would do a better job by creating a gold standard, a benchmark, if you will, that institutions could aspire to and be get a, a seal of a good housekeeping seal of approval. I don't even know that exists anymore. But the equivalent of that um, kind of thing, if we recognize institutions that did a good job, that that would be, we call them child kind hospitals. And, um, and so we set about trying to do that. And uh, I'm going to let Meredith take over um, now, after I used up all our time, uh, about how we did this. So we had a meeting, and we all came about developing a number of principles that are mandated for uh, child kind certification. Okay, sorry. Great. That's okay. Thank you, Neil. Um, so I'll just give a quick overview then of um, who we are at Child Kind and what we do, and how this supports um, the adequate um, pediatric pain management. So as Neil said, when Childkind was founded, um, we developed five the five principles that support the Childkind certification process. Um, the cornerstone of the principles is number one, where we really look for that institution-wide commitment to pain prevention and treatment. Uh, as we're certifying and evaluating a hospital, we also look at their ongoing education um, for all the healthcare uh, professionals within the institution. Um, we look at both pain assessment and treatment protocols, um, that there are up-to-date evidence-based protocols and procedures that are in place. And then last, we look at the um, ongoing quality improvement initiatives, that not only is a hospital applying the appropriate um, policies and procedures, but that they are also then um, monitoring things to make sure that the um, quality is there um, that they've developed. 
So the core components to Childkind include the certification process, as uh, Neil referred to. Um, this is where we have a certification committee that recognizes and evaluates a healthcare institution. Um, and we look to see that they've developed the um, standardized evidence-based um, policies and procedures for pediatric pain management, and that they show that they have excellence in their pediatric pain care. And if they um, fulfill all of the principles, then they are certified as a childkind hospital. Um, another core component to childkind is our knowledge dissemination. Uh, we have an open access resource library of policies and procedures in pediatric pain management. And that not only houses um, procedures that clinicians can use, but we have also grown to include um, some components for patients and families. We really believe in the whole um, sort of philosophy of building a community of practice with the knowledge sharing, with the uh, disseminating of information and awareness around the importance of pediatric pain management. Um, one of the things that we've done is we've developed a Childkind webinar series. Uh, we offer the webinar three times a year and it is geared towards the um, clinicians and, and hospital professionals, um, but we really focus our topics on, um, you know, important newer ideas in pediatric pain management to help share the information within the clinical community. To date, we have 17 certified institutions. Um, 16 of them are here in North America, really spanning from coast to coast um, in both Canada and the United States. And we have one certified institution in Singapore. Um, and we are looking to expand um, globally as well as throughout, um, you know, hitting further areas in North America. There's the, the rest of the list of the, of the 17. This just shows an image of the excitement of a team. Um, on the on the left hand side is the image of the team at CS Mott Hospital, which is affiliated with the University of Michigan. Um, and this is when they received their plaque um, after certification. And it's really a, a tremendous effort that they put into it. And I know that institutions are really proud once they have achieved the certification. And then you'll see an image of what the plaque looks like so that a hospital will have. This is a, a shot of our website, and you can see this is the landing page for a resource library. Um, like I mentioned already, um, somewhat we house um, materials for both clinicians and patients and families. Um, we've also recently added um, a uh, health, the, uh, the pain standard that was developed by the Health Standards Organization in Canada, which is a great starting point for institutions to really look to develop all of their um, pain care practices. As a part of Childkind, we're proud that we are endorsed by a lot of other organizations who are in the uh, pediatric pain care field. Um, it's it, We work closely with a lot of organizations in both the dissemination of information and also in the in awareness in this field. And along those lines, we also like to partner with organizations. Um, we are growing our partnerships um, each year. And again, it's a, it's a really important part of our growth and part of the awareness and education in the field of pediatric pain. And we're proud to say that we've really taken a look at our impact over the years. And um, to date with our 17 certified institutions, there are over 3 million patient encounters and over 200,000 surgeries or procedures, along with countless needle pokes that occur annually at our hospitals. Um, families can be assured that when a child enters a certified hospital, um, they know that that hospital is a place that has made um, a commitment to children's pain management and pain is a priority. Uh, another neat example is that in the city of Chicago, um, there is a group that meets every other month of clinicians from all of the pediatric institutions in the Chicago area, and they're all attempting to become uh, childkind certified, and that would make them the first childkind city uh, if they do all achieve the certification. 
And now we have reached the end of our presentation. Do we have a, a we have minus a minute for questions, <laughs> um, but uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. And um, we are happy to answer any questions that you may have. I, I just wanna say thank you guys so much. That was a, a wealth of knowledge that, that was just given to all of us. So I, I really thank you so much for that. Um, and I know we have a question in the Q and A, but um, I got sent a question. And it was, um, when you talk about the multidisciplinary approach, um, and, and really, you know, the biopsychosocial aspect of it, um, is there, and mind you, I know the, the answer to this, but we want your answer to it. Is there a difference between a psychologist and a pain psychologist? And is it, more important for them to find somebody who specializes as a pain psychologist? Yeah. Uh, well, that's a good, a good question. I mean, um, ideally, that's true. But basically, the type of uh, psychologist who we're looking for, for the most part, is somebody who does what's called cognitive behavioral psychology. Um, and that is, if they have that skill set, that's what we're looking at. All pain psychologists, that's what they're taught or that's what they're part of, but that's also a part of psychology training in general. So that's the kind of thing we're looking for in particular. And there are workbooks and things like that um, that are out there that can help the psychologist, if you will, uh, deal with that. So I do think it's important to find a pain psychologist, but they're, um, they're not that many of them. Uh, we're training a few, you know, Boston Children, we train a couple each year, but there's just not so many in the whole country. And so finding a psychologist or even a social worker, anybody who does cognitive behavioral therapy who can help you uh, with a variety of strategies that can dampen down the nervous system and somewhat help you understand your pain a little bit better. We're not looking for kind of analytic kinds of things or, you know, anger or this or that or the other thing we're looking, you know, and because we don't, they're not implying, obviously, if depression is an issue, we, that anxiety is an issue, we deal with those kinds of things. But from the pain perspective specifically, it's really helping to control the pain. It's a cognitive behavioral approach. And that can be any psychologist or uh, mental health clinician who's trained in that arena. That's what we would prefer. Obviously, we'll take what we can get. Um, there are a whole lot of online attempts these days too. Uh, like, you know, Casey, you and I were talking about what's called the comfortability approach, which is um, uh, now in 30 or 40 hospitals around the country, which does a one day training by a psychologist of 10 families or so of kids who have chronic pain and teaches them all the different techniques as best they can. And the kids can try on the different techniques, uh, if you will, see what works for them and what's best for them and most helpful for them. And that's been a wonderful addition because it sort of branches out, gets the skill sets um, to a, a broader audience. But that's that's what I would suggest. Again, a pain psychologist would be a luxury. Um, they're not around, they congregate in certain areas, but, um, but any psychologist, uh, can be helpful as long as they tend to focus on cognitive behavioral kinds of therapy and not are doing deep dives into your, you know, your past, if you will. Uh, if We're going to live in, a, in an, um, a wishful world here and wish that there was pain psychologists all over and ready for everybody. <laughs> right, right. Um, the next question is, how is it possible to make a diagnosis not by exclusion with a lot of different symptoms? besides pain that can be part of so many different conditions? Yeah, so that's a, a critical, obviously a essential kind of problem. Um, the reason we emphasize not by, I mean, obviously we are talking about doing some modicum of laboratory investigation. Um, we're talking about doing uh, in-depth history and, and in-depth physical. Um, so we're not doing nothing to address all those kinds of things. But the critical thing is that these problems have been around long enough for us to understand what they look like. And um, so, for example, they have classic patterns and, um, uh, and classic locations. And, um, and so if pain is wandering, uh, for example, you know, one of the classic things is more localized pain tends to be, you know, we go after a more specific kind of problem, if you will. We found a lot of kids with abdominal pain who had a very 
tender area, and that ended up being abdominal cutaneous nerve entrapment, something we didn't even understand before, but now is something that we know can be helped. But when they have more generalized problems, especially overlapping pain conditions, uh, and if it's a pattern that um, a, a, a pattern that we're familiar with that has been developed, the uh, GI people have been very sophisticated at this at developing algorithms about do this test. If it's this, this, then you know yield, and so you have a reasonable sense that this is more than likely this kind of problem. It's always possible that there's something very obscure. Obviously, you know, you know one of the big things you taught in medical school. If you hear hoof beats, you think of you know horses and not zebras. So you know we want to go with the more obvious things. Obviously, there are subtle kinds of problems that exist, uh, and um, we're finding more and more of those kinds of things. Um, but um, there's no downside to beginning a rehabilitation approach, if you will, for chronic pain in particular, even as we're exploring um, the potential of other kinds of explanations. And, and that's kind of what I would say to that. It's a very complicated area. The nagging doubt issue is a major issue that we, we grapple with. Um, and that's why you want physicians for the most part who have a comfort level, even with content with this kind of problem, neurologists who have a comfort level with migraine or tension headache, GI doctors who have a comfort level with DGBI, uh, as opposed to whether, because we want them to say, well, this is familiar to me. This is a pattern that's familiar to me. And uh, it has the classic hallmarks of that. Um, and that's the kind of key on it. You can always do more tests. And I can't tell you how many kids we see have had you know, so many, so many tests and so much investigation. And it, a lot of times it's expensive and a lot of times it's invasive. Uh, and uh, and if you have clues in that direction, you go for it. But um, but for the most part, if you don't, it probably makes some sense to start a treatment process and then check in frequently with the child, frequent subsequent visits to see that they're responding to the intervention. And if they're not, then more investigation might be necessary. Well, thank you. Um, another question that I got messaged was um, for for uh, patients and their families who are not getting empathetic care, and then they go to try and find another doctor, are then sometimes looked at as doctor shopping. Yes. yes. Um, and so how can a family kind of handle that, um, you know, uh, stigma that is associated with quote unquote doctor shopping when really they're just looking for the right doctor. And that is a very, very good question and a very, very challenging one. Uh, I would say though, you know, if you go from one to another to another, that's okay. If you go to eight of them, uh, you know, you start to reach a point where you're not getting the answer that you want to hear. And, and, um, if you will, and that's a different sort of story. Um, but you know, going from one doctor to the next, most doctors for a second opinion or even a third opinion in these very complex problems, uh, I think are fine. Uh, but you're right, there is stigma, you know, doctors, this challenges a doctor's self-esteem, uh, if you will. I mean, you know, there are complicated problems, families are not happy, you're used to wanting families to be happy uh, when they leave you. Uh, you don't want to feel that you haven't been able to address the concerns that they have. Um, and so it's frustrating when, you know, uh, there was a survey of, of uh, Texas neurologists. You, you mentioned you go to Texas Children's. These were pediatric neurologists, but they were surveyed, this was a number of years ago, about what conditions that they like to treat. And, uh, and I would say that tension headache was, give them a good epilepsy or, uh, you know, something else. Um, you know, that's great. But uh, when you're dealing with some of these other kinds of problems, which are much more vexing and more complicated and don't have easy answers. So they rated handling headache as one of their lowest, lowest priorities in terms of interest and frustration. And, and that filters out and they start to see families with, through that lens. So, um, but no one would have an issue if you're feeling you're with somebody who's not giving you the time of day or you feel you're getting a simplistic answer, go see a psychologist or, you know, let's try these drugs without any other sort of thoughtful interventions or without seeming understanding of what's going on or more and more and more and more investigation, then it might be time to look at somebody else, even, even if you hurt the guy's feelings or woman's feelings. All right, so I think we have, I got one more and then we have one more online here too. 
Um, the question that I was sent was um, when you talked about, you know, and I forget exactly what you said, so I'm going to paraphrase it um, about figuring out who the one doctor is, who's going to kind of con take over the control of, yeah. of pain. Accountability. Um, yeah. Yes. And so, but if, if they do have, like, if they have sent you to a couple different doctors, right, whether it's the neurologist, the anesthesiologist and a GI doctor, how do you figure out which one is like the chief and which one are the Indians? Like, how do you figure out which one's the head one to listen to yeah. and which one is, you know, the secondary opinion type of a deal? Another very good question. You guys are asking very <laughs> difficult questions. I mean, I, I we often will hear, and I've been on a committee where we interviewed lots and lots of families about this, and they reported that they felt that they were the general contractor and everybody else was a subcontractor, that the parents were the general contractor. So they didn't, you know, no one took control, if you will, and they had to find all the subs, and all the subs didn't necessarily talk to each other. Um, you know, being maybe hubris to some extent, but the pain doctor might be the logical person to be the captain of that particular ship. Now, some pain doctors, and I will say, if it's adult focused, they tend to be very, very procedural oriented, um, very procedural oriented, and we're not as procedural oriented for children. You know, we do some procedures, obviously, but not nearly as if you went to an adult. So, you know, we want to be sure that that there's lots and lots of interventions other than just sticking a needle into you and doing, you know, one thing or another. Um, so, uh, but typically the pain doctor, I would say, would be the person who would have access to a pain psychologist, uh, typically, or someone they could recommend who would say, well, this physical therapist makes some sense because when you've had experience with that, you know, they'd have the most experience at, at dealing with pain per se. That's not always the case. And there are certainly doctors in other fields who are very, very good at this and are, are familiar with what's going on in their particular communities. Uh, and that's what you need. If somebody knows what's going on in your community, who knows the people who are uh, empathic, uh, or relate to this kind of problem. Often they've had their own chronic pain problems or they family members who, who have, and so they're particularly sensitive and thoughtful in this arena. Um, but that's a tough, a tough problem. Awesome. We're asking you some tough questions late at yeah, night. Yeah, you are, you, you're killing me. <laughs> the next question, this one's a little easier. Okay. Uh, so the next one says, can individual doctors get certified? Would it be different price from the whole hospital certification? Meredith, do you want to handle that? <laughs> sure thing. Sorry, had uh, myself on mute there. Um, so no, at this stage, we do not do an individual certification for a physician. Um, we're just looking at the whole institution. Um, what we are growing into, though, is really to date, we've mostly certified the large tertiary children's hospitals, and we're excited to be expanding more into um, thinking about what certification might look like at a um, at a specialty clinic or at a community hospital or at a rehabilitation hospital. Um, we also recently certified our first children's hospice. So we're branching out in that way, but it is not an individual certification. Right. Although there was a practice actually that had multiple sites that did request possible child kind of certification, but we're not there yet. Uh, it's very labor intensive for us to do this and it's all volunteers and everybody can't run to all these facilities now, but, but we are thinking about that and certainly we're looking at multi-specialty practices that don't have a hospital base and one or two of those are already on in our pipeline there's about 20 hospitals that are, are institutions if you will that are in the pipeline that in various stages of uh of certification well those were all the questions that i yeah. was sent or that they came up on the q and a um, again, just on behalf of U.S. Pain Foundation and the Pediatric Program, I just want to thank you both for coming and putting on this amazing uh, presentation. And it's just, it is so important to all of our families um, and really trying to help understand the pain, um, the pain journey that they're on and really the importance of finding that empathetic doctor and how that alone can change the trajectory of that pain journey for their for their whole family. Um, and I love that you say that you want the family involved because that is something that we really strive for is making sure that the 
the whole family is involved in the care, in the support, in and that they are also getting the support that they need. The the parents are, the siblings are. That chronic pain does not just affect the child um, that is living with the pain; it affects the entire family. And so we really try to focus on that and try and really work on that family unit as well. So I appreciate that you spoke about that um, in your presentation as well. But I just wanted to say thank you both again so much for, for joining us. Um, and hopefully this just continues our relationship that we will be um, forming here. And, you know, we, we thank you guys for everything you're doing for all of these pediatric pain patients that are out there. And